All right, hello everybody and welcome back to the second channel. We are here back with another four authors and this week we've got sort of like a, a Patreon special you might call it. <laughs> um, I had four new people uh, sign up to my Patreon and as I'm sure you're aware if you've been keeping up with this channel, patrons get priority review. So we've got four patrons today. So we're going to get into it in just a second, but before we start, as always, I want to read this. Keep in mind, I am not a professional reviewer. I'm just some guy on the internet who likes reading and writing. The opinions expressed in this video are only opinions. My interpretation of or reaction to the work will not be the same as everyone else's, for better or for worse. I will look for the good and the bad, but no matter what I say, don't be too hard on yourself. Just keep writing. And for those in the comments, please be respectful. Also, I'm so sorry for any mistakes or mispronunciations of names or words. If I come across a word that I don't want to say for whatever reason, I will replace it with the word blank. So, let's go ahead and jump into it. We've got our first author here, um, Edward, or excuse me, Eduardo Cornejo, and... If you like what you see from them, you can find more of Eduardo's work at E. Cornejo Poetry on Instagram, at E. Cornejo Poetry. No content warnings for this batch, so we are just going to dive right in. There are three poems here, as <laughs> Eduardo graciously showed us. So this first one is called Orange Grapefruits on the Trees, and before we even jump into the poem... I just want to say I think that's a good title. Um, even even your title is important in poetry, right? And a lot of the times, like, I can't even think of a title for my works because, you know, they just don't come to me for whatever reason. But I like this title because it's just kind of intriguing, right? It's It doesn't sound generic, like if this were... Maybe this is a poem about love, but the fact that it's titled Orange Grapefruits on the Trees, that makes it sound more interesting than if it were just titled, like love or whatever else right uh so there's already something intriguing about the title we want to discover what is it about these orange grapefruits on the trees so anyway i'll stop yapping and we can read the poem orange grapefruits on the trees to my childhood in panama orange grapefruits on the trees beehives in the grass wooden slingshots in our hands wonder in our eyes we were children running free jumping fences climbing trees Chasing wondrous adventures under morning skies. Okay. Oh, sorry. And at the bottom it says E. Cornejo, New York 2023. I don't know that I would actually include that as part of the poem because all of these kind of have a similar signature. And I think that's cool if you use poetry as like a journaling method. It's And it's important too, or important, I don't know. I think it's important to note when you write your poems because then you can kind of see your evolution as time goes on. But anyway, some good stuff here right off the bat that caught my eye. Let's just take it line by line. So, orange grapefruits on the trees, beehives in the grass. Uh, that's an interesting visual because where are beehives supposed to be, right? In the trees is what I would imagine. And so it's like, why are they in the grass? Well, maybe these kids made them fall and the next line kind of confirms that where it says wooden slingshots in our hands wonder in our eyes and it's like that feels so childish like I don't mean that as an insult I mean what I mean to say is it captures the mood that I think the poem is trying to establish really perfectly right it shows you just kids being kids and sometimes kids do dumb stuff like shoot beehives with slingshots like this is anecdotal, but I remember my friends, uh, we, we hit a hive out of a tree one time and we all ran inside as soon as we did, you know, and I, I'm sure I'm not alone in that sort of thing. So it is just a very childlike experience to do that sort of thing. And I like this idea of like wonder in our eyes. Now, do I like condone that sort of thing? Probably not. I think if you need to have a beehive removed, there's a proper way to do it, right? But kids, they typically don't know any better. And so, like I said, it just kind of captures the experience of childhood. Uh, so it's a great use of showing rather than telling. And I, I actually, now that I think about it even more, I like the contrasting visual of orange grapefruits on the trees versus beehives in the grass. So there's that contrast there and you can imagine the beehives 
plural, I guess, were once in the same tree uh, as the grape fruits. And so in their minds, I'm extrapolating a lot here, making a lot of assumptions. Maybe in the children's minds, they think they're doing a service to the trees by getting rid of the beehives. Maybe they think they're like preserving the grapefruits, right? Like I said, that's extrapolation on my part, but you know, at least the poem allows itself to be interpreted in that way. That's interesting, right? Uh, the next stanza, we were children running free, jumping fences, climbing trees, uh, chasing wondrous adventures under morning skies. I do like the, the little rhyme between free and trees. Um, I think it's sort of maybe too explicit where it's like, I kind of got the sense, the tone, the mood. I got all of that from the first stanza. And then the second stanza, the first line in particular, I don't know that it like really adds anything to the first stanza. It, it's, it feels like telling rather than showing jumping fences and climbing trees. That makes sense. Um, and then chasing wondrous adventures. I think that's fine. Like, uh, it's not like, it's not so specific as we were children running free. It kind of gives you more to maybe imagine. Um, yeah. So if it were me, I just might change that line a little bit, maybe have it do a little more showing rather than telling. That's just me personally. Otherwise, I quite like this poem. And like I said, I think it communicates its point and its mood very effectively. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, in my reading, I felt there was sort of a slant rhyme between jumping fences and wondrous adventures. Now, uh, of course, that's like a very slanted rhyme, right? But there's kind of a similar sound there. And so I actually think that reads pretty well, those two lines in succession. Um, yeah, the first stanza is definitely the strongest one here for its showing rather than telling and the, the symbols at play with the grapefruits and the beehives. And you could even say the slingshot is a symbol as well. So there is a lot of good going on there. Um, I think it can just be built on even further. So good piece, good start. This next one is longer. It's called Sea Storm at Night. <clears throat> like a thousand summoned souls marching on a conjured sea, floating bodies of white mist have appeared in front of me. All around a haunting wind chants above the crashing waves. In this cruise, a swerving dance as if waltzing to our graves. Nauseous faces, somber eyes, weakened knees begin to fall. Citrus friends, the cabins cry through the creaking of their walls. On the dark and restless waves, the white mist keeps marching on, and this giant, helpless cruise cursed to slowly march along. Okay, okay. So first of all, I appreciate that we're going for a rhyme scheme here. Um, I've probably said it before on this channel, but poetry that rhymes will probably generally attract more readers than free verse poetry. Not necessarily. Like, I think people who like poetry are always willing to take a shot on a poem, no matter the form or structure. But I think if you present a poem to a non-poetry reader, I think if it rhymes, there's a higher chance that they'll be engaged. So just a little, I don't know, cheat code for you, I guess. Um, but I do appreciate that this is trying to rhyme. It looks like we have, you know, an ABCB rhyme scheme for each stanza here. So let's let's break it apart. Like a thousand summoned souls, that's a pretty good line. Um, kind of gives you something to ponder for sure. Like who is summoning the souls? Why are there a thousand of them? That's that's a lot of souls, right? So pretty good opener. Like a thousand summoned souls marching on a conjured sea, floating bodies of white mist have appeared in front of me. Overall, that's a pretty decent first stanza. I will say the word marching is later repeated twice in the final stanza down here. And so probably just want to reconsider, like, is there another word I can substitute in, in any of these three places to make it feel less monotonous? So that's just something to consider. But uh, on the whole, I do like this first stanza. Like a thousand summoned souls marching on a conjured sea. Uh, summoned and conjured both have a similar meaning. So that is kind of interesting. It, it almost feels like, you know, Again, it just raises the question, who's doing the summoning? Who's doing the conjuring? Um, and then the visual of floating bodies of white mist, you know, it sounds like it's just describing maybe your stereotypical ghost, but it's doing it in, you know, unique terms. So I actually like that pretty well. Um, 
Yeah, like I said, I think it's a good first stanza. I think the first line is a good opener. It creates some intrigue, so let's keep it going. All around a haunting wi- uh, excuse me, all around a haunting wind, chants above the crashing waves, in this cruise a swerving dance, as if waltzing to our graves. Um, so I get the sense that, you know, the speaker is on a boat, although it's probably not a real boat based on the words summoned and conjured. Um, this, the, the language here is just a little bit like expected almost, um, similar to marching where it's not that these words are like repeated again throughout the poem, but like they're repeated in a lot of other poems like waltzing for example i feel like that's a word i see with decent frequency in other poems and so i think you could swap that out for something else um i do kind of like swerving not bad not bad um I, and i haven't mentioned this yet but the rhythm it uh, it has a nice feel to it it's as if we were on a rocking boat right all around a haunting wind chants above the crashing waves in this cruise a swerving dance as if waltzing to our graves i like it it, it reads well um nauseous faces somber eyes again somber is kind of one of those words where it's like uh that's one i've you know seen in a lot of poetry i do like nauseous faces as a visual and somber eyes it gets the point across i just think there's another word you could use in place of somber nauseous faces somber eyes weakened knees begin to fall Citrus friends, the cabins cry through the creaking of their walls. Um, it's kind of a funny line. Uh, it sounds like, you know, everyone's dealing with scurvy and potentially that's what everyone dies from on this boat. We'll see. On the dark and restless waves, the white mist keeps marching on and this giant helpless cruise cursed to slowly march along. Yeah, so it's it's not even just the repetition of the word march, marching versus march. It's the even the phrase marching on versus march along. That's kind of ostensibly just the same phrase, right? <laughs> I uh, I think you could replace at least one of those, if not both, since we already used the word marching up here. Um, just depends how the author wants to organize each word, I suppose. Um, and again, the word dark, it's just kind of a really basic, simple word. It could probably be replaced with something else. Um, so I don't dislike everything that's going on here. There really is some good stuff. Uh, like I said, the first stanza really is quite strong. Um, it, it almost feels, though, as if maybe there's not quite the payoff that I was expecting when reading that first stanza. Because I feel like the first stanza presents me with a lot of questions. It's like... Um, who are these souls? Who summoned them? Who conjured this sea? Uh, they're apparently ghosts, as it's described here. I, a reader assumes, right? Um, and why do they appear in front of this speaker? And I feel like most of those questions just kind of go unanswered. Um, so, you know, I, I get the visual, and I do like the visuals. It's like, if you're going to write a poem about a ghost boat, um, the visuals are about as, you know, spot on as it gets. <laughs> Um, I just think maybe the language needs some reconsideration, just a few particular words. Um, and also like the progression where I just don't know that, uh, the poem tells every, tells, tells the audience everything they might want to know. And, and I've said this before, it's a hard line to walk because on the one hand, you kind of want to preserve some mystery for the reader, but at the same time, you don't want their, you don't want so much mystery that too much remains unsolved because that kind of thing is unsatisfying to a reader right so again it's a fine line to walk it's really hard to do heaven knows i can hardly do it uh maybe on a good day right um but there is a lot of good working here the first stanza has a lot of promise and i think if we were to just hone in on that first stanza and ask where can i take this in a way that's satisfying to the reader and also maintains some of the visual appeal that's here within these other stanzas so it's going to take us to the third one from eduardo this one is called white cloud <clears throat> anna come look at the sky a white whale is in the clouds 
It appeared before my eyes, just a peaceful breeze ago. And to think the other day silver dolphins, brave as swords, fiercely pierced into the waves of that menacing dark storm. But at last the waters shine, mornings glide on golden wings. Anna, bring the telescope, there are feathers in the wind. Okay, I, I like the sound of this. This actually kind of reminds me of, like, Emily Dickinson. Let's see, is this common meter? Hang on. Uh, Anna, come look at the sky. A white whale is in the clouds. Not quite, but pretty close, pretty close. Um, it still does have kind of that Dickinson sound to it, especially with the way that rhyme is kind of being played with here. Um, I also like the first line, Anna, come look at the sky, so immediately we're introduced to a character. That's another kind of cheat code in poetry, is like, if you present the poem as a narrative, then audiences are more likely to be invested. And if there's a character, we know there's probably a narrative, right? So, Anna, come look at the sky, a white whale is in the clouds. It appeared before my eyes just a peaceful breeze ago. So like I said, there's kind of some interesting stuff going on with the rhyme here, where sky and eyes rhyme, but clouds and a go don't really rhyme. And that's unconventional, right, to have like an A, B, A, C rhyme scheme. Um, but the rhythm kind of keeps keeps it moving, and that is kind of why I said it was similar to Dickinson. Like, if you think of... Um, what's a, what's an example from her yeah i heard a fly buzz when i died uh the stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm like room and storm barely are a slant rhyme arguably uh but it's the rhythm that makes it sound cohesive and that's kind of what's happening here so i like that um i assume the whale is just another one of the clouds right but the poem might be more interesting if it were a literal whale, like if the reader was meant to believe that it's a literal whale, because that might be the way that a child would see it. And so maybe if you remove the word white and just say a whale is in the clouds, then it then it contrasts the whale from the clouds, right? Because the title of the poem is already White Cloud, and we just as human beings know that clouds in general are white. Um, and so if the whale is not white, that separates it from the clouds and it kind of gives a visual for the, the reader to latch onto and not just a visual, but like a fantastical visual, a whale flying through the sky. That's really interesting. Right. Um, and I, I also want to mention, I like the phrase a peaceful breeze ago because the word ago usually refers to time, right? You would say a month ago, a week ago, but when it refers to a breeze, that's unique. That's a nice play on language there, on, on language conventions. Um, it's it's not a real measure of time. And again, it kind of sounds like something a kid would actually say, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, moving on to the next stanza. And to think the other day, silver dolphins, brave as swords, fiercely pierced into the waves of that menacing dark storm. So... We have kind of more consistent rhyme here. Day and waves are slant rhymes, and then swords and storm are slant rhymes. And they're pretty interesting ones, too. I, I've said this before, I am all for unique rhymes, and usually slant rhymes are just going to be kind of unique by nature uh, because they haven't been done to death, right? Uh, I, I did kind of want to mention that in the last poem, too, where some of these rhymes, like C and me, like here in this first stanza, that's just kind of generic, right? Uh, it's kind of obvious almost. So you might think of more interesting rhymes to substitute instead. But here, these sound a little bit more interesting. Um, and I like the simile, brave as swords, because it's not just a simile, it's also personification, because like swords aren't brave, they're objects, right? You might say someone who holds a sword is brave. And so what does it mean to be brave as swords? Uh, that gives something for the reader to think about, and that's interesting. So I like that simile. Um, and then it kind of extends where it says the dolphins pierced into the waves. And to call them silver dolphins, like silver is technically still the color that a cloud could be, but it's also the color that a dolphin could be, right, in theory. So the reader might imagine it as literal dolphins, which again is just a fun visual. Um, but, you know... We also have the menacing dark storm mentioned here, 
And so it sounds like the clouds are transitioning from gray to white. Although this is a flashback to think the other day, right? Um, but I, I do like everything up to this point. Last stanza, we'll see if we bring it home. But at last the waters shine, mornings glide on golden wings. Anna, bring the telescope, there are feathers in the wind. So I kind of like the ambiguity, actually, because it's like, I'm not sure if I can tell what exactly happened here. It kind of sounds like it rained, right? I think that's what's supposed to be implied by the water's shine. Or maybe it's just that the clouds, you know, look really beautiful in the sky. Um, or maybe it's literal waters, like a body of water on the ground. Um, mornings glide on golden wings. It's not a, it's not a terrible line. Um, in some ways, it just sounds maybe a tiny bit generic, um, where it just reads like a phrase that I would read in other poetry. I don't know. That one might be more subjective than some of the other words I've pointed out. Um, and the last line is interesting, too, where, again, I, I kind of like the ambiguity. There are feathers in the wind. It's like, where did those come from? Because whales don't have feathers. Uh, dolphins don't have feathers. Um, clouds don't have feathers. So where did these feathers, quote unquote, come from? And it actually kind of makes me wonder uh, if I reinterpret the poem, if, is the whale actually a big bird? Were the dolphins actually birds as well? And is that why there are feathers in the wind? And so really there's a lot for a reader to discover here. And it's uh, it's not quite like the last poem where there was like a mystery element and there were questions to be had. Instead, it's just kind of you get to discover as you go with this poem specifically. Um, there are clearly, as I've shown, multiple ways we can interpret this. And I like that. Um, yeah, the, the the operative devices here aren't quite as like specific or mysterious as the last poem, so I think it works. And it kind of uh, adds to the story here of cloud watching, because that's typically kind of a laid-back activity, and you, you make what you will of it, right? You can use your imagination to your heart's content, and so I think that theme fits better here um, with the structure. I did want to point out the last poem also had these ellipses, and I'm not really sure that they're doing anything for the poem, but again, that's kind of bias on my part, where I've said before I don't love just <laughs> like random punctuation in my poems um, or structure that doesn't seem to serve a purpose. Uh, again, that's just like personal preference, that's bias, but I do just wonder, would the poem read differently if the ellipses were gone? I don't really think so. I think it would read the same personally. Oh, and I did want to point out too the, the slant rhyme between wings and wind. That sounds pretty nice, honestly. But at last the waters shine, mornings glide on golden wings. Anna, bring the telescope, there are feathers in the wind. Yeah, I just like the way that that reads. Uh, I also like there's an ambiguity in the relationship between Anna and the speaker. It's like they could be... Uh, sweethearts, they could be siblings. That was kind of how I was reading it initially, was as siblings uh, playing together, watching clouds together. But they could have any sort of relationship, right? It could be like father, daughter, uh, potentially even mother, son. Although, you know, most children don't call their mothers by their first name. Not all, but you know. Um, so yeah, I like that there's sort of an ease of interpretation. Not ease, but like uh, kind of a multiple choice interpretation here and all <clears throat> I'm so sorry excuse me I was going to say all of the poems read pretty smoothly uh, they all have kind of a nice rhythm to them and that's great because you know poetry ideally you want it to sound pretty nice you want it most of the time to roll off the tongue you know except in certain cases and I think all these poems do that um they, they really do have a nice ring to them. So, Eduardo, really good stuff. This was awesome. One more time, if you want to find more of Eduardo, you can find him at E. Cornejo Poetry on Instagram. These were really cool. They really only need minor tweaks, if any. So that's going to take us into our next submission here. 
Uh, this is unique because these are song lyrics rather than strictly poetry, um, and I'll have more to say on that in a minute. The author is uh, Chris Pitts, and he submitted a Spotify link um, with his submission, and he mentioned that his band's name is OK Neighborhood. Um, I have not yet listened to the song. I wanted to kind of just see the lyrics on their own first. Um, I thought that would make me potentially... Uh, I thought that would make for a more interesting analysis. Potentially, it, it'll depend. And like I said, I'll say kind of more on that in, in a moment. But I think he is on Spotify with his band. Um, Chris Pitts, OK Neighborhood, on Spotify, maybe. <laughs> but we've got some song lyrics here. And what I wanted to say, and you know, I kind of gave the whole spiel in my video about whether song lyrics count as poetry, but it's like, we're taking the lyrics on their own here, but that might honestly not be doing it justice because song lyrics are written with a different approach than poetry is most of the time. Like, uh, there was the article I mentioned in that video. I think the author was named Zephaniah. I think that was the last name of the author. And it was just about like how, yeah, technically song lyrics are poetry, but to reduce them to that kind of takes away from everything else that goes into the musical craft. And so we are just analyzing the lyrics here, just reading the lyrics, but there is probably more to it than this, uh, more from the music, the instrumentation, the way that the lyrics are sung. There's probably a lot that we're missing. And so we have to keep that in mind as we read. But this first one is called violence. Violent is the way I choose to stand. Violence wipes the blood off of my hands, and every time I think I'm doing fine, I find that there's more violence on my mind. Violence is what pushes through the lies. I'd give up all my friends to see the light, and hope can be a lonely, twisted road, and everyone that's on it is alone, and it's the same for me. Violent is the way I choose to stand. Violence wipes the blood off, my, off of my hands, and surely I'd surrender to the night if there were not this violence that's inside. Okay, so again, we have to remember that these are song lyrics, and so there is a lot of like explicitness going on here, a lot of, you know, really telling you how it is. <laughs> and in poetry, um, just as a personal preference, I don't always love poetry that's super straightforward like that, but when taken as song lyrics, um, you know, it's a different ballpark, obviously. So we'll just take a look, take it line by line as we would with any poem. Violent is the way I choose to stand. Violence wipes the blood off of my hands. So that second line, that's a kind of an interesting, what would we call it? Maybe an oxymoron where you would think that violence causes blood on one's hands. But here it's just the opposite where violence uh, apparently cleans the hands of the speaker. And I may have mentioned this either on this channel or on the main channel, but hands are just a really common literary symbol and often they're just representative of one's character, right? So if somebody has blood on their hands, for example, Lady Macbeth, it shows that they're guilty, that they're violent, that they're a defiler, right? Um, if somebody has like well-worn hands, maybe calloused hands, in theory that shows that they're a hard worker. One of my favorite examples is a book called East of Eden by John Steinbeck, one of my, probably my very favorite book, honestly. Um, the, the character of Kathy in that book, oh, and spoilers, by the way, because I have a friend who's reading this right now. <laughs> um, the character of Kathy in that book, as she gets older, her hands get really, like, kind of nasty. Um, and she retains her beauty for the most part, but her hands kind of show her true, ugly character. So um, that's just one example, a good example, I think. But anyway, so we have an interesting oxymoron there. Next line. And every time I think I'm doing fine, I find that there's more violence on my mind. Not much to add there. Uh, like I said, kind of just explicit. Um, the These two stanzas, there is a bit of repetition there, so we'll take a look at how it changes. But moving on. Violence is what pushes through the lies. Sorry, is my camera shaking here? Let's see. Anyway, 
Violence is what pushes through the lies. I'd give up all my friends to see the light. So I assume that that line means I'd give up all my friends to see the light in, in the sense that they would give up everything if they didn't have these violent tendencies anymore, which, uh, fair, but also kind of interesting where it's like you have friends, but you have violent tendencies. And so it's like, that would put your friends in danger theoretically, and you would give up your friends to not be so violent anymore. But at that point, it's like, what good does that do you if there's no one around you to commit violence on anymore? Um, and obviously, you know, you could make new friends at that point, but just kind of an interesting dichotomy potentially. And hope can be a lonely, twisted road. Um, kind of a cliched symbol. Um, there might be one to replace it with. Um, but it does get the point across, and again, this is a song, and it's good that the listener understands what's being said. <laughs> and everyone that's on it is alone, and it's the same for me. Uh, this stuck out to me on the first reading, and I want to point it out here, just the fact that there have been rhymes up to this point, stand, hands, fine, mind, lies, light. That's a slant rhyme, but still. This line ends with road, and this line ends with me. So they don't even rhyme in the slightest, right? And I think that lack of a rhyme, that lack of resolution, feels very intentional, right? And hope can be a lonely, twisted road, and everyone that's on it is alone, and it's the same for me. There's really no feeling of conclusion there. Uh, it kind of makes you restless as a reader. It's like, you want that conclusion, but it's out of reach, and that's probably how the speaker feels, right? So, effective. Violent is the way I choose to stand. Violence wipes the blood off of my hands. And surely I'd surrender to the night if there were not this violence that's inside. So again, kind of interesting where, similar to this symbol, where it's like violence is acting in a way that we don't think of as violent. It's like, I'd surrender to the night. That sounds like a bad thing, right? And yet the violence that's inside is keeping them from surrendering to the night. Now, potentially, surrender to the night as a phrase could mean, you know, take one's own life. Um, Chris did not include any content warnings, so I'm inclined to think that that's not true. Otherwise, I feel like that would be a content warning. I don't know. Um, but if that is what it means, is it better to live as a bad person, a violent actor, than to just die? I think that raises an interesting question, right? Um, on the other hand, maybe violence means something else. Uh, it could be that the speaker isn't committing violence, but maybe they're a victim of violence, and somehow that victimhood is what keeps them going. Uh, let's read the poem if that is the correct interpretation. Violent is the way I choose to stand. So in that sense, it sounds like, you know, the speaker is one who would commit violence, but... Violence wipes the blood off of my hands, and every time I think I'm doing fine, I find that there's more violence on my mind. So that works still if the speaker is the victim of violence, where in this case they would just be afraid, and maybe maybe their status as a victim makes them think that they're innocent, or makes them uh, unable to commit violence of their own, right? And that's why it wipes the blood off of their hands. Violence is what pushes through the lies, I'd give up all my friends to see the light. So that still works, even if the speaker's a victim. They could be thinking, like, I'd give up everything if it meant I didn't have to remember the violence committed against me. And hope can be a lonely, twisted road, and everyone's on it. And everyone that's on it is alone, and it's the same for me. Violent is the way I choose to stand. Violence wipes the blood off of my hands, and surely I'd surrender to the night if there were not this violence that's inside. Um... I think it I think it works with either interpretation. Either the speaker is the one committing violence or they are a recipient of violence, a victim of violence. Um, and it's kind of neat that we can read it in both of those ways. I think we're meant to read it as the speaker is a violent person because, you know, that's what they've indicated to us uh, kind of explicitly. Um, but there there are questions to be had here, right? Um kind of a bummer of a song either way that you read it 
but I get that all songs are not supposed to be happy. Some songs are meant to be a bummer, so that's fine. Uh, there is some interesting stuff going on here, and like I said, you know, if I were reading this as a poem, I would have more critiques. And even as a song, I might still reconsider that metaphor, see if you can't make it something more interesting. But even as a poem or as song lyrics, there is interesting stuff going on here. I do like the sort of the oxymoron of this phrase, and kind of the the subversion with the last two lines as well. So interesting stuff to be had here for sure. This next one, I believe, is called Buried Away, and the format is a little bit different than on the last one, and there we go. <clears throat> Buried away, deep in their weeds, this wound that won't heal just constantly bleeds. So inside my garden, where there is no mud, the violets and roses are growing in blood. As years have gone by, I've learned how to laugh and smile a little, but how long will I last? Because buried away, deep in the weeds, is a wound that won't heal, it just constantly bleeds. It gnaws at my insides and glows in the dark, that wound that won't heal has calloused my heart. And how I have longed for a touch of your robe, to dry up the blood, for us all to be whole. So I will not rest, I will scream in the weeds, for my wound that won't heal, that just constantly bleeds. That's right, sorry, this one was called Wound That Won't Heal, I remember now. Um, okay, so there are some things to unpack here. For one thing, I will say, just right off the bat, I think these are song lyrics too. I think both of these pieces are songs. Um, but this one reads like much more explicitly like poetry. It has a, a pretty consistent meter all throughout. And I mean, obviously, a lot of songs are going to be that way too. But uh, as I read it, it just read like poetry, right? I'm sure you as a listener got that sense that it just sounded like a poem. So anyhow, um, I wondered, I think this is the wrong form of there. I think it's supposed to be T-H-E-I-R, but whatever. Buried away deep in their weeds, this wound that won't heal just constantly bleeds. Um, I've mentioned many times repetition's not my favorite device in poetry. I don't typically love refrains like this one where uh, this phrase is repeated, uh, wound that won't heal, it just constantly bleeds. We see that a few times throughout this piece. In a song, obviously, it's a little different. For one thing, most songs are built with a chorus in mind, and choruses repeat, typically. <laughs> um, so, in that sense, it's fine, you know. And also, it, it's possible that there is more meaning to be had with each repeated phrase. Let's keep taking a look. So inside my garden where there is no mud, the violets and roses are growing in blood. It's kind of an interesting visual where you have a, a garden where rather than dirt, there's just blood. Um, it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of edgelord-ish if I'm being honest, but uh, I think the visual is decently effective. Um, as years have gone by, I've learned how to laugh and smile a little, but how long will I last? That's a pretty relatable sentiment, right? Like, you know, I've experienced depression before, and a lot of the times when I'm feeling better, sometimes I can't help but think, like, how long will I feel happy this time? When will I spiral back into depression, right? So I, I think that's poignant. Um, I think putting that in explicit terms, especially in a song, is effective. Ah, I got blurry again. Come on, work with me, camera. Because buried away deep in the weeds is a wound that won't heal. It just constantly bleeds. It gnaws at my insides and glows in the dark. The wound that won't heal has calloused my heart. Gnaws at my insides is kind of just a little bit cliche. I do like glows in the dark, though, because it's like, that sounds cool. <laughs> I like things that glow in the dark, like clothes, like toys. Um, but for a wound to glow in the dark... On, on the surface, that sounds like, oh, rad, but it's actually very sinister, right? And so that's kind of a neat subversion of that idea, that something that gives light and darkness is actually a hindrance rather than a help. Um, this next stanza was the most interesting one to me. And how I have longed for a touch of your robe to dry up the blood for us all to be whole. I'm pretty sure that's a biblical reference. It sounds a lot like the story of Jesus and the woman with the issue of blood, 
where she followed after him and just touched his garment, I think is the word that the Bible uses. And just by touching him, she was healed. And so I think that's what's being referenced here. Um, and how I have longed for a touch of your robe to dry up the blood for us all to be whole. And again, that's just like a relatable sentiment where it's like, we all, I think, wish that there were a God who would just end all suffering, right? Like in the, in the Christian sense, we could say we wish that Jesus would come to the earth again, as is prophesied in the Bible, so that he would end all suffering. At least I think that's sort of the sentiment that's being communicated here. And uh, to that point, it's like, uh, I don't know, I just want to say I like the illusion here. And uh, not just for the sake of it being an illusion, but the fact that it creates a relatable feeling in the reader, right? Like, wouldn't we all just want our suffering to be taken away by a single touch? Of course we would. And then that takes us to the last stanza. So I will not rest. I will scream in the weeds for my wound that won't heal, that just constantly bleeds. Okay, so pretty consistent visuals all throughout with this idea of the garden and the kind of the blood. And it's like, it is kind of edgy, but at least it's not over the top where it's like, uh, there's like so much blood and gore. And I think that would be annoying if, if done incorrectly. Here it's a little more subtle and I appreciate that. Um, I don't know that the refrain like took on new meaning each time. I think it would sound pretty good in a song. I like I like in in most music when the chorus kind of changes it up a little bit each time. So even though like the wound that won't heal that just constantly bleeds, even though that's the same in each stanza, which kind of a different intro each time, assuming that this is supposed to be the chorus. So there's a lot of neat stuff going on here, and I'm sure it would. I'm sure both of these pieces would sound all the better when put with their music. But as lyrics, they're really not bad at all. Not at all. And, you know, I'm not a songwriter. Like, <laughs> I guess I've written a couple songs, but I wouldn't call myself, like, qualified to, to tell musicians how they should write their songs, uh, including their lyrics, even though I'm a poet. Like I said, I know that poetry is just different from lyric writing. So anyhow, one more time. That was Chris Pitts was the name of the author. And potentially his band, OK Neighborhood, is on Spotify. So thanks a bunch, Chris. Let's move on to our next author. This one's interesting because this author submitted one piece uh, that they wrote and they also asked if they could submit some pieces from their grandfather. So this is going to be interesting. Um, our poet this time is named Max Dubois, and his grandfather is named Wesley Dubois. And you can kind of see this here, but let me get it away from the background text. Uh, they are at Max-Dubois on YouTube, and they also have a website, www.maxdubois.com dot bandcamp.com and Dubois is spelled D-U-B-O-I-S I guess I don't know with certainty that that's how it's pronounced I just kind of assumed but uh, there are a couple content warnings here the first one is just I assume kind of silly it says scaring the ducks and the second content warning is about the Korean War um, but Max also mentioned that it's not like explicitly violent or anything so let's go ahead and get into it <clears throat> oh, I do want to say, before we actually get into the poem, I like the drawing. Um, a lot of poetry books these days, particularly insta-poetry books, are padded with drawings, and those drawings really vary in terms of their quality, but here I, I do quite like this drawing, I, if I'm being honest. As I ride the zero turn, circling round the grassy berm, carving lines in emerald tines parallel to the pond, the waterfowl are planted firm and quack in no uncertain terms. They hate the roar of the lawnmower. Then I am riding on. The drake, he gives a beastly stare. I settle into leather chair, pitting feathers versus levers, engine rising to a roar. Lady ducks, twin maidens fair, stand behind their duke, the heir. The mallard acts his bravest quack, hearkening to nights of yore. Those brazen barks won't work on me. These silly ducks are silly geese. I barely hear patriarchs cheer. 
bearing down, they bolt upright. The flock, it turns to fly to flee, away from man's machinery. They abscond into the pond and leave me to my yard work plight. Ooh, really good stuff here. I'm liking this a lot already. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, they left a note uh, accompanying the piece saying, I work as the landscaping slash groundskeeping guy at a school, and I mow around the duck pond once per week. The locals dislike this. So funny in the context of the poem. Um, and it is kind of a bummer that the, the speaker that Max themselves have to mow around a duck pond and the ducks, you know, are disturbed by this. That's, that's just a bummer. I feel bad for the ducks, but who wouldn't, right? And it's not Max's fault. He's obviously just doing his job. And it seems to me that he feels bad about it, but I don't know. We'll see. One thing I want to point out uh, that immediately struck me is the structure here. We have a rhyme scheme where it's A, A, B, C, but on the B line, we also have an internal rhyme. Um, and then the C uh, is in the next stanza. So A, A, B, C, um, A, A, D, C, right? Because firm and terms kind of rhymes with turn and berm up here. So that's really fantastic. That takes a lot of thought to do a structure like that. And I think it. I think the execution is really mostly on point. So let's take a look at the content. As I ride the zero turn, circling round the grassy berm, carving lines in emerald tines parallel to the pond. So just right off the bat, like it's a good opening stanza. Um, in part, maybe even majorly because of the rhyme like turn and berm, that's not a rhyme I think I've ever heard. And so I like that a lot. Lines and tines is like maybe a tiny bit more cliche, like maybe I've heard that before, but it's still like not trite. It's not something I've heard a million times before, not something that has me like, eh. No, I think that's still a decent rhyme. And then just on the whole, the stanza reads pretty smoothly. As I ride the zero turn, circling around the grassy berm, carving lines in emerald tines parallel to the pond. Uh, that fourth line, that has a nice sound to it, parallel to the pond, especially like from the lines that come before, where this one just feels a little bit shorter, almost maybe more purposeful is kind of the sense that I get. But anyhow, um, we're immediately planted into this narrative with the imagery, right? We have a speaker riding a zero turn, as they call it. Uh, they're going around in circles. I, I like the way that this is phrased, carving lines in emerald tines. What a creative way to say, I'm mowing the lawn, right? Love that. Parallel to the pond. The waterfowl are planted firm and quack in no uncertain terms. They hate the roar of lawn mower. That, uh, I think this is supposed to say that I am riding on, but yeah, you get it. Um, pond and on, right? There's the, the C rhyme there. Um, and it's just like, it's just a funny visual here. I just, <laughs> the, the phrasing of this quack in no uncertain terms. It's like in theory, quacking is uncertain terms because we have no idea what they're saying when they quack. And yet here it's kind of clear. We, we pretty clearly know exactly what the ducks are saying. They're saying, that they don't like the lawnmower, that they, they want it out of their space. So, moving on. The drake, he gives a beastly stare. I settle into leather chair. Pitting feathers versus levers. Uh, feathers and levers, that's a great slant rhyme, love that. Engine rising to a roar. And so, there's a contrast between the drake and the speaker, where the speaker feel it, they seem kind of relaxed right it says they settle into leather chair whereas the duck gives a beastly stare and um it kind of uh more firmly establishes the message of the poem which i think is kind of you know environmentalism versus human interference basically and so we literally have a case of uh nature versus man <laughs> man versus nature uh, where the man is riding a man-made contraption and the nature is just this duck. Lady ducks, twin maidens fair, stand behind their duke, the heir. The mallard acts his bravest quack, hearkening to knights of yore. 
So some pretty fun language there where the duck is being compared to a knight or a warrior. I like that a lot. It's just kind of funny again. This whole poem is just kind of funny. <laughs> like there's, there's a real charm to this. Um, and then I also like the internal rhyme of ack and quack. It's just simple but effective. Um, next stanza. Those brazen barks won't work on me. These silly ducks are silly geese. Again, that's just funny because, you know, silly goose is a colloquial phrase. But then to say it about literal ducks, it's just kind of funny. I, ba I barely hear patriarchs cheer. Bearing down, they bolt upright. So in this case, nature loses, right? The duck tries to give a quote-unquote cheer, tries to quack really loudly. But the man on the machine, he doesn't even hear it. And so the ducks, they run away. The flock, it turns to fly to flee, away from man's machinery. Again, flee and machinery. I like that rhyme. They abscond into the pond. Um, uh, I do like the rhyme, abscond in pond, though I don't know if it's technically correct, because I'm pretty sure abscond means to run away with something that you've stolen, right? Um, and leave me to my yard work plight. Um... So maybe the speaker doesn't actually feel bad about having to do what they do to the ducks. It almost seems like maybe they take amusement in it. And I don't say that as a condemnation of the speaker, though I do feel bad for the ducks. Um, it just kind of seems like, you know, it's something that the speaker feels they have to do. And in a broader sense, that kind of says something about like man's expansion through nature, right? It's like, we're all just part of the, the system now. We all unfortunately, are part of the, the capitalist wheel that keeps on turning. Um, we all kind of, in a way, interfere with nature just by living on this planet. And we didn't ask to do that, of course. Um, and it's not necessarily our fault. And again, I feel that way with the speaker, where it's really not their fault. They're just doing their job, right? Um, and maybe this is what they have to do so that the ducks don't do something stupid. I don't know for sure. Um, overall, the poem just has a lot of charm to it. Like I said, I love the structure and it paints a, a clear narrative and a, a funny narrative, right? And one that actually isn't just funny, but potentially has something to say about man's place in the world and man's place in nature specifically. So your classic man versus nature narrative. So this is great. I would read a whole book of poetry like this probably, and not like not literally just like this, like every poem should be different, but I would read a whole book of poetry where there's, you know, some creative technical poetry on display. Um, maybe technical is not the word I'm looking for, but you know, poetry that's clearly structured. Um, not that I don't like free verse. I read free verse poetry books all the time. It's kind of all I've read this year, I'm pretty sure, but it's nice to get poetry that like has so much thought put into its rhyme and its structure. That's really cool. Uh, then we're going to move on to the poems from Max's grandfather. Um, I think these are three separate poems. Let's take a look. <clears throat> so these are poems from Robert Wesley Dubois. This first one is Untitled from 1952. Tis night, and on my cot I lie, wondering if soon I too must die, never to know what life might be, but hurried into eternity. How would it come? Swift as an arrow, soft as a breeze, fierce of the roar of an angry sea, heaving and tossing, frothy and white, in daylight's first dawning, or the still of the night. The battle is raging, I hear it so clear, cannon roar loudly, I lie here in fear, for soon I must rise and silently go, to aid my poor comrades who lie in the snow, fighting and bleeding, fighting some more, cursing the cold, the dread, the dead, and the war. We're going up front, the captain just said. Put on your gear, get out of that bed. Soon I will know sadness or joy, to live as a man or to die still a boy. Ooh, that last line is really, really cool, really powerful. Uh, not cool in the sense that it's like, uh, admirable, no, uh, just impactful, right? It's got, it's got some oomph to it. Um, the rest of the poem felt a little bit trite, just in the sense that like, I feel like I've read a lot of poetry that is similar, um, 
a lot of rhymes that felt kind of conventional, like lie and die. And even be and eternity just kind of reminds me of uh, Because I Could Not Stop for Death by Emily Dickinson. It's hard <laughs> for me to see the word eternity in a poem and not just be immediately reminded of that, which to me is like the quintessential use of that word in a poem. That might sound silly, like, I don't know. But uh, kind of like we saw with one of our previous poems today, just a lot of these phrases like swift as an arrow, soft as a breeze, fierce of the roar of an angry sea. Uh, those are just phrases that feel really common today. And heck, maybe in 1952, it was different. Maybe these phrases hadn't been done to death at that point. I don't know. I wasn't around in 1952. Nor could I definitively say that I've read a lot of poetry, specifically from 1952, that reads just like this. Because, like, that was kind of the modernist era and kind of budding into the postmodern era. And so poetry at that point didn't really look like this anymore uh, with, like, conventional rhyme and structure. It was kind of becoming really unconventional. Um, so, yeah, there's that for you. But... Really, that last line, heavy and, like, impactful. Soon I will know sadness or joy, to live as a man or to die still a boy. I feel like there's, like, a lot that's implied in that final line that's not being said. And that's what makes it so effective is, like, if, if the speaker lives through this war, then technically, yeah, they live as a man, but, like, how much weight does that have? How much value does it have to live as a man? And to live as a man, do you have to do something like go to war? What does that say about like what a man is, right? Uh, the way that we interpret a man. And in that sense, is it better to just die as a boy? So there's a lot to consider with those last two lines, and I like that a lot. Um, yeah. It's really, I will say despite how good the poem technically is or isn't, it is just interesting to like get a first-hand account via poetry of somebody who was in a war, right? It's, it's brutal. And you see that brutality. And like I said, regardless of how good the poem technically is or isn't, you definitely feel the feelings that are being conveyed here. Uh. Look ye to the future, behold a world so strange. Dream if you must, you wise ones, create if thou wouldst a change. Let, let yon mountains of iron and steel frown down on mountains of old. Destroy if thou wouldst the country road, and its place rest one of gold. With engines of fire, drive the birds from the blue. Let it be known that your desire is the blood of your brother too. When you can no longer see birds winging, nor hear the laughter of free men ringing, thou hast, then hast thou finished improving the earth. Look ye to the future. What is it worth? Okay, so uh, technically, <laughs> I do think this is a better poem than the one we read before. Uh, there's a note here, let's see. First, learned by Robert W. Dubois at age 13 in 1947, did not read, have searched for author for 49 years, author unknown, unless it is God. Okay, so one of these poems, apparently, is not actually Robert's original work, but is one that he learned and transcribed. So I wonder which one that is. Um, is it the untitled one? Is that what it says? I don't know. I do, I do like that note. I, maybe we assume it's this poem, because the note is, of course, right underneath it. And I, I, you know, I don't take the note literally as part of the poem here. Um, but I do kind of like the phrase author unknown, unless it is God. I think that's interesting. And like, if you do believe in God, then you might argue that all poetry comes from him. Like, I'm sure we could look at so many Renaissance poets and not just Renaissance, but probably even up to the Romantic period who would say that their poetry comes directly from God, right? Anyhow, look ye to the future, behold a world so strange, dream if you must, you wise ones, create if thou wouldst a change. So not really a strict meter happening in those first four lines, but that almost kind of serves the poem because, you know, strange and change, it's not like the most unique rhyme in the world, but I do like the sentiments that these longer lines convey, which is nice. 
Um, and we're going to see kind of a, a stark contrast from these first four lines as we go. And so it's a, it's a good establishing, even though it is like very explicit in what it's saying. Um, it's kind of necessary, I think, but we'll see that as we go. Let yon mountains of iron and steel frown down on mountains of old. Destroy if thou wouldst the country road, in its place rest one of gold. So interesting where there's kind of more ambiguity here where we're frowning down the mountains of old to replace them with mountains of iron and steel. And it's like, does that actually sound great? Or replacing the country road with one of gold? Like that sounds like a pretty grand visual, but like what was wrong with the original country road, right? And then it becomes all the more explicit here. With engines of fire, drive the birds from the blue. Let it be known that your desire is the blood of your brother too. So that line is like a little too explicit for me, and it doesn't help that blue and two is just kind of a really generic rhyme. But I do actually like the imagery of like, with engines of fire, drive the birds from the blue. Let it be known. Yeah, I like that imagery. Um, it's clear, obviously but gets the point across. And, you know, like I said, it builds, there's a culmination to this point where it grows more explicit, where it's like, improve the future, but do it by uh, actually making the world more industrial. And the poem kind of not very subtly is saying that sounds terrible, right? And it becomes all the more explicit when you can no longer see birds winging, nor hear the laughter of free men ringing. Then hast thou finished improving the earth? Look ye to the future, what is it worth? So it's a really pessimistic poem, uh, uh, looking to the future and seeing only industrialism and all the negative connotations, all the negative side effects that industrialism is going to bring to the world. And it's like, you know, looking at the future about 70 plus years on, it's not really wrong, right? Industrialism has made the world a worse place in a lot of ways, replacing country roads, replacing mountains, um, driving the birds from the sky. It's terrible. And, you know, we can look at this as pre prophetic, really. I also liked that the rhyme scheme changed at the end, where before it was uh, A, B, C, B. Down here, it's just A, A, B, B, right? So kind of interesting. Um, like I said, a technically better poem than the first, I think there's a nice progression to it. And, you know, there's kind of a twist too, which is fun for a reader generally. But anyhow, let's move on to this last one. <clears throat> Why haven't you written? That's a good title. I like that. Just the line to say I'm living, that I'm not among the dead, though I'm getting more forgetful and mixed up in my head. I got used to my arthritis, to my dentures I'm resigned, I can manage my bifocals, but gosh, I miss my mind. Sometimes I can't remember, when at the foot of the stairs, if I must go up for something, or if I just came down from there. And before the fridge so often, my poor mind is filled with doubt, have I just put food away, or have I come to take some out? There are times when it is dark, and with my nightcap on my head, I don't know if I'm retiring or just getting out of bed. So if it's my turn to write you, there's no need for getting sore. I may think that I have written and don't want to be a bore. So remember that I love you and wish that you were near. But now it's nearly mail time, so I must say goodbye, dear. P.S. Here I stand beside the mailbox with a face so very red. Instead of mailing you my letter, I have opened it instead. It's kind of a cute ending, but the subject matter is obviously like really sad. Um, and I say it's cute because like the speaker describes their embarrassment, right? And it's like, I was picturing, you know, this little old man kind of reciting this poem, describing these actions. And so for him to kind of be embarrassed about, you know, why he went to the mailbox and it's, you know, funny because it's everything that we read before, but in practice now. So a lot of interesting stuff here, honestly, or <laughs> sorry. I was kind of on autopilot with that phrase. What I meant to say was, it is kind of cute, despite the sad subject matter. And even though this poem is, like, put in really simple terms, it's an experience that's uh, not quite so touched on as war is, right? Like, 
I feel like I've read a lot of poems and a lot of literature about war specifically, whereas poetry about like dementia or Alzheimer's, I haven't quite read so many poems or literature about that. And so in that sense, the poem just reads more creatively because it's based on creative subject matter. And that's why I always tell people, you know, when you write poetry, do it in terms that are creative. Like, uh, don't don't talk strictly about the thing that you're talking about, right? Use other means to describe it. Uh, but in this case, it's a matter of I haven't read a lot of poetry with this subject matter. And so on its face, it sounds a little bit more creative. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like the whole experience is just being repeated over and over again where it's like the subject goes to one room or to one object and they can't remember if they're coming or going basically and that culminates of course in the final stanza which is you know kind of a joke but a, a sad joke a tragic joke um so anyhow there is a lot of good stuff here and this might honestly be my favorite of the three poems um it's tender it's kind of heartbreaking um, the, like I said, the title jumps out at you and you get the answer to the title in the poem very clearly and not clearly in a, an obvious way, but clearly in a way that kind of, you know, makes you rethink the title. Honestly, that, that to me is when a title is most effective is like, does the title carry on a new meaning after I've read the poem for most poems, the answer is going to be yes. But yeah, that's strong. This is a strong one. Um, it's simple, and there is a place for poetry like this. Uh, I could honestly see this appearing in a children's book, like to teach them about, you know, how dementia works. I think this would be an effective teaching tool for that scenario. So, Max, I want to thank you for your poem and for sending your grandfather's poems along. That was really cool. So once again, our author was... Max Dubois. He's on YouTube at Max hyphen Dubois. And he's got his own website, www.maxdubois.bandcamp.com. So thanks a bunch, Max. It was really cool to, to look at your poem and then also look at some of those poems from the past. So that's going to take us to our last author today. They go by J.W. Griffin. Um, we do have another content warning on these works. One of the poems refers to a hypothetical murder, but only in the abstract. Okay, good to know, good to know. Um, and there is a note here. Uh, they, the author, J.W. Griffin, wrote, I am completely unpublished, and my only prior experience with critique has been a couple poetry workshops I took in college. Nice, we love poetry workshops. I want to know what's working about my writing and what's not, so please don't spare any potential critiques or comments. All right. This first poem is called, maybe it's pronounced Vimir or Wymir, I'm not sure. I am convinced that I must collapse before I am reconstructed, flung by inertia, my, sec my fecund flesh bursts against the standing stone, an overripe fruit leaving only stains of before, a membrane dripping to the floor, and a viscera slick newborn wailing in a maelstrom of new sensation. The infant hastens to salvage its rotting chrysalis, desperate like a creation myth, to fashion its is from its was, to become a thing upon which to build. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, okay, yeah, that is where that one ends. Um, I felt that that poem got progressively better the more I read it. So let's take it piece by piece. I am convinced that I must collapse. Um, I don't know about that line as an opening. It's like, fine. I don't know that it's necessarily like a hook, especially like as we go deeper into the poem and it's like the really interesting stuff starts happening. I don't know. Uh, I am convinced that I must collapse. It doesn't necessarily like give an indication of what the poem's actually going to be about. And not all first lines have to do that, of course. But, you know, the poem became really interesting as it went on, and I might not have gotten that just from the first line, so just something to consider. I am convinced that I must collapse before I am reconstructed, flung by inertia, my fecund flesh. So, fun language going on here. 
unique language, right? I like the phrase flung by inertia, my fecund flesh, interesting. And then that continues, uh, by the way, good place, good use of enjambment um, as it goes on. Like you could read that phrase on its own, just my fecund flesh. You could say flung by inertia, my fecund flesh, right? So it could be the eye that's being flung or it could be the flesh that's being flung and the enjambment makes that possible. So moving on, bursts against the standing stone, an overripe fruit leaving only stains of before. I'm trying to think if I have anything I want to say about that. Uh, the overripe fruit, I suppose, is kind of an interesting symbol, especially if we take it next to the standing stone. Might even be a stone fruit, right? So that's kind of neat. Um, I don't know about the only stains of before line. Eh, maybe. I don't know. But this is where it kind of gets interesting. A membrane dripping to the floor, and a viscera-slick newborn wailing in a maelstrom of new sensation. The space there is really interesting. Like I said, generally I just like poetry for the strength of its language. I don't typically focus on, like, punctuation or when the words are spaced apart like this. It, seem, it, it generally seems arbitrary to me, but here... It's kind of interesting, I'll admit. Um, wailing in a maelstrom of new sensation. Maelstrom, by the way, another good word choice. I like that. Um, and I, I just like the visuals that have been happening up to this point where it's like the, the speaker has collapsed and from their body is emerging a baby that is, as far as we can tell, basically tearing through the old body, right? Like... It, uh, it, it says it in this line, it's rotting chrysalis, right? It's, it's like how a butterfly would come out of its cocoon, a cocoon that used to be its body. Maybe I'm no scientist. Anyway, the infant hastens to salvage its rotting chrysalis, desperate like a creation myth to fashion its is from its was. That was probably the most interesting line in the poem to me. And it caught me off guard at first, but once I got it, I was like, ooh, to become a thing upon which to build. So, kind of interesting. Uh, I think broadly the poem is just about change, whether we're capable of change, and whether it's good to change. And I think it's described through this metaphor of like a new self bursting through the old self. And you see the new self, uh, as it says here, trying to cling to its old self. The infant hastens to salvage its rotting chrysalis. And so it kind of raises this question of like, if we do change, how thoroughly should we change? Like, what aspects of ourself should we hold on to? What aspects should we salvage? Or maybe it's better to just become a thing upon which to build, right? So, like I said, I thought the poem got better as it progressed. All throughout, there's a pretty uh, solid word choice. I like a lot of the unique words that have been chosen here. Uh, yeah, if it were me, I think I would just kind of maybe add a first line here that sort of indicates what we're in for, just a better hook. Like, you don't even have to take this out, just add something before it in, in its place. That would really be my major piece of advice here. And why mirror? I will have to look up what that means. This next poem is called Nostalgic Jigsaw. And just looking at it, right, again, we see kind of like, is this formatting choice? Is that going to lend to what's happening here, or is it going to seem arbitrary? We'll find out, right? Nostalgic Jigsaw. I wish I could lay you out, pull you apart, and catalog with encyclopedic rigor all your little cutting pieces. Figure out where you fit together smoothly and where you don't. Love. I try to grasp their genealogies. Imagine what hammers broke you so as to leave behind such fragments. Note to self the margins to remind me that that it is not perfectly given or received, isn't your fault, and that you love me deeply, if love can be lost. But every time I think, in transit, about the expanse that sits between us, the whole exercise feels worse, or distended. Memories stretch thin strength, make mockery of firmness, no exacting observation by the recipient of a fault can pierce the blinding wall of blood and memory and intercepted hardship. Roads that never needed walked, words that never needed spoken, 
and every experiment with contempt feels a trespass. At the end of the day, does it even matter? I guess I wish I could sift you, set apart your little cutting pieces, and see how much of you is left for me to hold on to, whether you offer it or not. Okay, so a few things I would like to take a look at and point out. Um, little cutting pieces was used in the first stanza, but there is quite a bit of space between it that some readers might not even remember that that's technically a repeated phrase. And even though I remembered, I actually don't mind it as a repeated phrase because for one thing, I think it's an interesting visual. Like puzzles aren't usually made from pieces that will cut you. That would kind of defeat the purpose, right? And so it's interesting to envision a person as a puzzle with pieces that can cut. I think that's interesting. Uh, the other thing I want to take a look at is the parentheticals, because it looks like they can be read separately from the rest of the poem. So, love is not perfectly given or received. If love can be lost in transit or distended by the recipient, does it even matter whether you offer it or not? So that's kind of neat, because like the parentheticals, I think, still work in their respective lines, but then you can also read them as their own mini-poem within the poem, so that's kind of cool, actually. Um, in fact, let me read that one more time. Love is not perfectly given or received in transit by the recipient. Does it even matter? Oh, wait, I missed one. Hang on. <clears throat> love is not perfectly given or received if love can be lost in transit or distended by the recipient, does it even matter whether you offer it or not? Okay, interesting. As for other things that are working here, let's just take it piece by piece. I wish I could lay you out, pull you apart, and catalog with encyclopedic rigor all your little cutting pieces, figure out where you fit together smoothly and where you don't. So again, some fun diction here. Uh, I like encyclopedic rigor, and as I pointed out, I think little cutting pieces is an interesting take on the metaphor of uh, of the the subject being a puzzle rather than a person. Um, I try to grasp their genealogies. Imagine what hammers broke you so as to leave behind such fragments. So that's why the pieces are cutting, right? And then I like the idea that each piece has its own genealogy. And again, that's just a good word, good word choice. Note to self, the margins to remind me, that is, is not perfectly given or received. Oh, sorry, that it is not perfectly given or received isn't your fault, and that you love me deeply, if love can be lost. But every time I think in transit about the expanse that sits between us, the whole exercise feels worse or distended. Memories stretch thin strength. The, the, these two lines read awkwardly to me. I get that there's like some alliteration going on with both the M and the S sounds. Memories stretch thin strength, make mockery of firmness. Um, I would rewrite those. I think they read just a little bit too awkwardly compared to the rest of the poem. Kind of takes the reader out of it a little bit. At least it took me out of it. But anyway, no exacting observation by the recipient of a fault can pierce the blinding wall of blood and memory and intercepted hardship, roads that never needed walked, words that never needed spoken, and every experiment with contempt feels a trespass. At the end of the day, does it even matter? I guess I wish I could sift you, set apart your little cutting pieces, and see how much of you is left for me to hold on to, whether you offer it or not. So... I don't uh, think the poem is like hard to grasp necessarily, but I'd say that having read it twice now. And I think it helps that we have the parentheticals, which are kind of revealing more of the true meaning of the work, which has to do with love and the giving of love and the receiving of love. And so it sounds like, you know, the speaker wants to understand their partner but maybe their partner isn't so giving as to make themselves understood. And even if they were, you know, would that be enough for the speaker, right? Um, so really interesting stuff, honestly. You'll notice I didn't do much analysis as I read through it the second time because, frankly, I just kind of liked everything that was going on. I think the poem is kind of easy to get lost in. Um, and on its face, I think comparing a person to a puzzle is maybe a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know if uncreative is the right word, but it, it just, 
it seems like an easy kind of metaphor, potentially. But here it's done so creatively that it doesn't feel easy, right? There's a lot going on here. Initially, as I was reading the first time, I was almost thinking, maybe this should be two separate poems. But no, as I read it the second time, I think it all works really well together. I will say, though, I'm not sold on the random indentations. I don't know that that's really doing anything for the work personally, but that's just my opinion. This is good. Really, really good. Both of these have been good. That moves us into the last one. This one is called A Vuncular Nightmare Interrupted. Last night I dreamt... Sorry, I will read it in just a second, but that's a good title. Um, and it, it shows the author's style in the sense that they've used a lot of creative word choice up to this point, and avuncular, I like that a lot. Uh, I'll be honest when I say I am not even sure that I know what that means. So it's a nice hook in the sense that I want to uncover what an avuncular nightmare even is. So good title. Last night I dreamt I had killed my uncle. So unlike other dreams, it's intent crystalline, gazing into my aunt, waiting for the moment of warping my thoughts, a self-aware noose. How can you live with this coiling up inside you, that furrows deeper from the surface? I recoil from mirrors, horror reflected in others, in the moment of collapse. I pace the dreamscape, I know their suspicions won't touch me. You have only yourself to live with, not that you need more rope. The unexpected inevitable arrives in the clangor of a phone call, the medium unimportant. The truth is in the mirror, her horror, which is mine. Live with the things you do to people, and they reflect on you. Shattering and shattering, oh, how we reflect. Okay. So, I don't think it's hard to understand what's happening in a literal sense, where the speaker has a dream that they killed their uncle, and the guilt obviously eats at them, especially as they see their reflection in a mirror. Um, but also, it sounds like, you know, based on this stanza, for example, I recoil from mirrors, horror reflected in others. It sounds like it's not just literal mirrors, but the speaker sees other people as mirrors. Um, when they look upon others, they see the horror in themselves, which is kind of interesting, because mirrors, gosh... I feel like I've read a hundred poems about mirrors, like no exaggeration. And so here it's kind of interesting in the sense that it's not just mirrors, but it's other people, right? At least that's my reading of that stanza there. Um, taking it piece by piece, last night I dreamt I had killed my uncle, so unlike other dreams, it's intent crystalline. Um, gazing into my aunt, waiting for the moment of warping, my thoughts a self-aware noose. Um... Yeah, again, it just kind of reemphasizes that idea of, like, uh, the idea that's kind of said explicitly at the bottom. Live with the things you do to people, right? Um, just a sense of, like, I think my reading of the poem is that this dream is representative of something else that the speaker has done. Not a murder, necessarily, but just a bad thing that a speaker has done to a person. Maybe even their uncle, right? And they, the guilt is manifest as a dream where they actually kill their uncle. Um, and then these words presumably are words being spoken to the speaker, possibly by the aunt. How can you live with this coiling up inside you that furrows deeper from the surface? Um, so again, that to me just reemphasizes that interpretation on my part where the, the dream is just a manifestation of guilt at the way a person was treated. Um, and then we talked about the I recoil from mirrors. Um, I pace the dreamscape. I know their suspicions won't touch me. So again, that just kind of reemphasizes the guilt, but also a sense of like confidence that the speaker won't be caught. But it sounds like false confidence just based on the rest of the context of the poem. And then here we have more words that are presumably being spoken to the speaker. You have only yourself to live with, not that you need more rope. And that kind of... Uh, at least to me, I read that as an extension of this line up here, uh, where one's thoughts are a noose. Um, and in a sense, this is relatable, where it's like, all the time, maybe not all the time, but a lot of the time I find myself thinking of like mistakes I've made in the past and bad things I've done to people. 
and it hurts me and it makes me want to like uh i don't know suffer as like penitence for what i've done to these people right and i feel like that's almost what's happening here where it's like the the, the thoughts of what we've done to others act as like a noose in a sense right so let's keep going with these thoughts in mind. The unexpected inevitable arrives in the clangor of a phone call, the medium unimportant. Um, I interpret that as just the end to the dream, but it also could be in the context of the dream where the speaker is being caught via phone call, right? Um, so it takes on a double meaning there where it's like maybe the speaker is being awoken from their sleep by the sound of a phone call but maybe in the context of the dream, it's also that the jig is up, right? The truth is in the mirror, her horror, which is mine. So again, the mirror, it sounds like, is another person, in this case, the aunt, right? The truth is in her horror, which is mine. Live with the things you do to people, and they reflect on you. Shattering and shattering, oh, how we reflect. So I, I actually really like that idea that, like, we are reflected in other people. And when you look at another person, you probably, maybe without realizing it, you see a part of yourself, right? You see yourself reflected in that person. And so when you've done something bad to another person, it might feel like a negative self-reflection, right? When you see a person, you might only think of uh, the rude thing that you did to them, and that makes you feel bad, right? And maybe the, the person doesn't even know about it. Anyway, these are the thoughts and interpretations that come to me, and maybe I'm applying too much of a personal reading to this, but in any case, I think it's a well-written poem, and I think, like I said, taking mirrors and making them other people, it's very creative, very creative way to use mirrors in a poem. Um, I think the format here is a little more purposeful, feels less arbitrary, where here we have like the framing where this is a dream that I had, and so indentation, here's what's happening in the dream, and then another indentation, here's dialogue that's happening in the dream. That kind of makes sense to me, personally. Um, like I said, doesn't feel quite so arbitrary, so it's fine. Um, but ultimately, of course, the strongest piece, the strongest bits of this poem are what we saw in the previous two poems, where strong word choice and really interesting development of ideas, like on the last one, right? A puzzle seems kind of like an easy metaphor where it's like people are made of lots of different pieces and we kind of try to put them together even if they don't want to be put together etc that's kind of easy right but the speaker put their own twist on it or excuse me the author the author put their own spin on it and the same thing happened here with the mirror and the dream uh so i like these poems because they say more than what's actually being said right and that's the mark of good poetry for me and I think that's where we're going to end it. I honestly don't have a ton of feedback on these last two poems that we read because I just thought they were quite good, frankly. So I'm sorry. I know that you, J.W. Griffin, I know that you asked for um, for me not to like spare any potential critiques or comments, but I just didn't have many. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I just thought they were good poems, frankly. Um, really creative use of devices. Yeah. I'll just leave it at that. So this has been a good review. Thank you to everyone who submitted. This was really, really great, truly. Um, and thank you all for supporting me. Um, I know that, you know, you essentially kind of paid me to review your stuff today. And I thank you for supporting me financially, monetarily in that sense. And I hope that my services have been, you know, of use to you. So we're going to leave it there. And thank you to everyone who watched. Um, if you'd like, you can share your thoughts on the poems in the comments. And in any case, this is a rough draft. <laughs>